during this most recent presidential election cycle, I was, I was dumbfounded by the number of candidates uh, initially who had tossed their hats into the ring, both on the Republican side and the Democratic side. Of course, the Republicans, I can't remember the number, I think it was 17, maybe even 18 potential candidates when the, when the uh, uh, process began. Not knowing exactly who I wanted to vote for, I decided I'm going to attend a number of the local rallies. I wanted to hear from these candidates what they believed and, and what they were going to stand for and what they were going to push for. And I went and listened to, to Bobby Jindal and Rick Santorum, Chris Christie, Marco Rubio, Ben Carson, and Donald Trump. And I found it interesting, a couple of those uh, were actually just in people's homes. We sat around in a living room on a sofa with a veggie tray and some chips and soda and, and chit-chatted with the candidates. That was kind of fun. And a couple of them were big rallies with metal detectors and, and armed security and, you know, it, it would have been harder to get through uh, the TSA at an airport than it was to get, or easier to get through the TSA at an airport than it was to get into these rallies. It's amazing what we do with politics, isn't it? While we, while we criticize and complain about politics and politicians, nonetheless, we recognize the place and the role that these men and women fill. And there's a certain a power in the position. There's a certain awe and respect that, in, at least in some cases, is shown. And then I got to thinking about today. Today's Palm Sunday. Today is all about the coming of not a king, but the king. Put the word the and capitalize it before king. Today's about the coming of the king. We, we look back historically approximately 2,000 years and we, we focus on the triumphal entry, the kings coming into Jerusalem. But we also, in our lives, look forward to the fact that the king is going to return. He is coming. I want to walk through three texts with you today. I'm sorry that they're not as visible as I thought they would be. The first one is Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 16. Let me read that for you. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey and there, tied there, and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them. And he sat on the coats. Most of the crowds spread their coats in the road. And others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple, and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. 
But when the chief priest and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have prepared for yourself praise? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. This is one of the texts that we're probably quite familiar with. The triumphal entry. This is the beginning of the week and, well, on Friday, Jesus will be crucified. And there's, there's so much in this text. I could spend forever right here. And I've got two more texts, so I'm going to just hit some highlights that I want to set before you this morning. First of all, verse 5, the fulfillment of a prophecy with the words, your king is coming. Your king is coming. Now, of course, in 1776, the United States declared their independence from the king of England. We no longer wanted a monarch to reign over us politically, economically, militarily. And so, in our nation's history, the concept of a king is somewhat alien. It's somewhat foreign to us. We know that Britain and the British Empire still has a monarch, but rather symbolic, not much more than that. We do hear of kings in other nations and kind of wonder at how that works. But very simply, very simply, a king is a singular ruler. Not a government of checks and balances with an executive branch, a judicial branch, and a and a legislative branch such as we have. But one who sits upon a throne, his word is law. His word is the rule of the land. He is king. And here comes Jesus. And he's riding in on a donkey. We're told that he's gentle. He's not one of those who is malevolent, not one of those who is dictatorial, not one of those who longs to crush you under the weight of a heavy hand. He is giving. Matter of fact, he is entering into the city of Jerusalem. He is entering into the capital of Israel that he might him his life. Lay down his life. Your king is coming. One of the things that we need to grasp is that he is indeed king. He's our king. He reigns. He rules. While our nation may be a democratic republic, the church is a monarchy. And the monarch is not the preacher in the pulpit. The monarch is not one of the elders. The monarch is Jesus. And we need to grasp that and embrace that and therefore submit ourselves to his reign and to his rule. The second thing that I see here in verse 9 are simply the words that the crowd cries out. Hosanna to the, king, or to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna was a, was, was a, a word of praise. It become a word of praise, but it was also a petition. It means save us. Save us, O son of David. Why son of David? If you're a student of the Old Testament or you've been in church long at all, you flash back to King David as he ruled over Israel long ago and God made a promise to him, made a covenant with him that one of his descendants would sit upon the throne of Israel forever. Son of David was a, a title for the Messiah. It was a title of hope that when the son of David came, this king, would be an eternal king. This crowd is recognizing that. Save us, son of David. Praise to you. Blessed are you, for you are the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We look for salvation in so many areas. We look for salvation in our politics. 
If we can just get the right person in the White House, if we can just get the right combination of people in the legislature, if we can just get the right rules passed, the 6,000 years of human history have shown it doesn't work very well. Whether it was the ancient empires of Babylon or Persia, whether it was the Greeks or the Romans, whether it was the Ottomans, whether it was the British, whether it's the American. <laughs> Humanity messes things up. You know that, don't you? Humanity messes things up. We need to look to Christ. For He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the one that we need to look to for our salvation. And He is the one whom we need to praise. But verse 15 points something else out to us. On this day that was filled with energy and excitement, Jesus riding a donkey into the city, the crowds crying out words of praise. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. There were nonetheless the detractors. Verse 15 tells us about the chief priests and the scribes who were indignant. They were ticked off. They were upset. They were angry. They were the opposition party. Luke tells us the Pharisees actually stepped forward and told Jesus, rebuke your disciples. Do you hear what they're saying? Rebuke them. Tell them to stop it. And Jesus in the Gospel of Luke says, you know, if they fall silent, the very stones along the road will cry out. For God will receive praise. Some friends of Gretchen and mine in college sang together as a husband and wife team for many years. And one of the songs they sang said, No rock is going to cry, or is going to shout for me. No rock is going to shout for me. It was a declaration of our intent to be the voice of praise. Regardless of the opposition that may come. And opposition does come, not only to Jesus, but to his followers. Therefore, we have to be willing to stand. Again, and I, I hope you don't get tired of the, the political comparisons, but there's the coming of the king here. You know, in, in the current administration, there's an awful, awful lot of opposition. One of the things that frustrates me is we've come to a place in American politics that no one really wants to get anything done. They just want to sling mud at everybody. But in the previous administration, it was the exact same thing. Only now it's the Democrats slinging mud at a Republican president, and two years ago it was Republicans slinging mud at a Democrat president. And no one wants to accomplish anything. There's opposition. There's opposition. And there will be opposition to those of us who follow the King of Kings. Don't fall silent. Don't let a rock have to cry out his praise in your place. But you speak for him. The second text I want us to take a quick look at is in the book of Revelation. I want us to go from 2,000 years ago to sometime in the future. And this future may be today. This future may be millennia from now. I have no idea. But in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 16, we get a picture of the coming of Christ in his eternal glory. It is now the end of time. Earth as we know it is going to be remade. There will be a new heaven, a new earth, and the eternal reign of Christ. John says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. 
From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is a glorious picture, isn't it? You talk about pomp and circumstance. You know, it, 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 it's amazing sometimes if you, if you watch C-SPAN or if you watch any of the political stuff that's on TV, regardless of who the president is, when he enters the, the, uh, the, the Senate chamber of the House uh, and they play hail to the chief, <laughs> there's, there's a certain uh, glory to that. Uh, that's not a good word. Uh, the pomp and the circumstance. Boy, that's nothing compared to this. John's vision, heaven opens. End of time. Jesus is coming. And we see him, John's trying to describe Jesus, the indescribable, within the confines of human language. You know? Has anyone ever been to the Grand Canyon? Has anyone ever been to Niagara Falls? Has anyone ever set out at night and gazed upon the stars scattered across the universe? And then you tried to explain what you saw to somebody? Even if you take a picture. You know, Janai had the joy of setting out in Alaska on several nights and watching the northern lights and trying to describe it to me. I've seen pictures of the northern lights. I want to go to Alaska and see the Northern Lights. Because as hard as she's tried to explain it to me, or even how beautiful the pictures are, they fall short. John, in human language, is trying to tell us something here that is, well, beyond the telling. And I don't have time to walk through every description, but I want to pull out just a few. First of all, Jesus here is referred to as the one who is faithful and true. It's the exact same name that he is given in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, when he reveals himself to the church in Laodicea, a church that had a lot of problems. He said, I'm faithful and I am true. Faithfulness. Kind of a lost trait in our day and age, isn't it? We've lost the concept of faithfulness and fidelity in marriage. We've lost the sense of faithfulness and fidelity in our relationship with Christ and his church. We've lost the sense of faithfulness and fidelity in relationship to maybe a, a, an employer. There's all kinds of, of ways that we've lost the sense of faithfulness. But Jesus says, I am faithful. I do not waver. I am the same today as I was yesterday and will be tomorrow. You can Count on me. <laughs> and he's true. There is no falsehood within him. Therefore, there needs to be no doubt in us. And Jesus rides forth. And he rides forth, we're told in verse 11, to bring judgment. A righteous judgment. That judgment will be made on the basis of his word. This sword that comes out of his mouth, it, it, it's just the word. <laughs> Hebrews says that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Jesus, by his truth, judges in righteousness. And apart from Christ, that would strike terror into my heart. For I know that I am unrighteous. Even as we sat this morning, this isn't in my notes, sorry, I'm going to get sidetracked. I sat here with the bread and with the fruit of the vine in my hand and, and was mindful yet once again that, that Paul reminds us of Jesus' words. This is the new covenant in my blood, which is for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And I sat there and just kind of had a mental flashback and I thought, man, I'm an unrighteous person. I am sure glad that there is the blood of Jesus that cleanses from all unrighteousness. You see, even in our picture here, his robe has been dipped in 
blood. Some people think that that's the blood of his enemies. I think it's his, the blood of his sacrifice. For he comes to judge in righteousness in accordance with his truth. Even his name, verse 13, his name is called the Word of God, which takes us back to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The Word became flesh and dwelt for a while among us. Jesus in all his glory. And we see that he is named King of kings and Lord of lords. King of kings and Lord of lords. Of all the kings that have ever been on the face of this earth, he is king of them all. Of all of those who wore the name or the title of Lord, Jesus is Lord of them all. And it takes me back to Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, where we're told that ultimately every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is, is Lord to the glory of the Father. His supporters and his detractors will bow and will confess. Again, it's not interesting how over the past, I don't know, eight, ten years, both with President Trump and with President Obama, depending on your politics and how vocal you want to be, we hear this phrase, not my president. Donald Trump is not my president. Barack Obama is not my president. We hear that a lot, don't we? I guess you're not an American citizen then. Because both of those men either are or were president of the United States. And if you're an American citizen, that makes him, either one of them, your president at that time. But you see, let's take that into the story of Philippians. Jesus isn't my Lord. Jesus isn't my king. He can't tell me what to do. I'm my own man. I'm my own woman. I'm going to do my own thing. I don't need this Jesus stuff. I don't need this Christianity that you guys talk about. Not my Lord. But there comes a day when Jesus splits the heavens and comes forth in his heavenly glory and Every knee will bow. Not most, not some, not just his supporters, but even his detractors and his fiercest opposition. Every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess. Everyone from Adam to the last human on earth Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. And for those of us who have accepted Him as Savior, that is glory. And for those who have rejected Him, it is terror. The King is coming. The King is coming. Are you ready for His return? Last text, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. I love this little verse. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. Let me go back up and read verse 27 with it as well. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await for him. Basically what the author of Hebrews says, Paul for Kent's sake, but the author of Hebrews says is this, Jesus came once to bear sin. Jesus came the first time. What we read about in Matthew chapter 21 and the king coming into Jerusalem, he came to go to the cross he came to lay down his life. He came to be an atoning sacrifice. This coming Friday, Good Friday, I pray that in the midst of the busyness of your work day and all of your family stuff, pause and picture Christ on the cross. 
bearing your sin. The atoning sacrifice. That's what he came for. But Hebrews 9.28 says he's going to come a second time. Not to do that. That's already been done. The second time he comes to bring salvation for those who eagerly await him. He comes to take us home. In the upper room, as he spoke to his apostles, remember he said, Hey, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back and get you so that you can be where I am. That's what this is about. The king is coming to get those that he has redeemed. To get those who what? Eagerly await his coming. And so I simply put in my question, or in my notes, this. Is this you? And is this me? Meaning this, are you eagerly awaiting his coming? Eagerly. Well, when he gets here, okay, I hope I'm ready. hope I'm not too busy. You know, if I've got concert tickets or ball game tickets, I really hope he waits till after the game. <laughs> That's not eagerly awaiting his coming, folks. Oh, my wedding's going to be in June, or the baby's due in August. I really hope he waits till afterwards. <laughs> That's not eagerly. John concludes the book of Revelation by saying, Amen, come Lord Jesus. May that be our prayer. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. If it is Sunday, April 9th, 2017. I cannot think of a better conclusion to this sermon than for the heavens to be rent and for us to see the rider upon the white horse. He whose name is faithful and true. The word of God who is king of kings and lord of lords. Wouldn't that be a cool ending to this sermon? How about I just keep preaching until it happens? What if it's today? Are you eagerly waiting? Got something better to do? Eagerly waiting. Oh, Jesus, come. He comes to bring salvation to those who eagerly wait him. Is this you? Is this me? Palm Sunday. The beginning of what we call Holy Week. Thursday marks the night in the upper room, his betrayal, his arrest. Friday marks his crucifixion. Saturday marks the fear of the apostles, their lostness, their desolation. What now? Sunday marks life. For the stone has been rolled away and the tomb is empty. And he is risen. He is risen. Palm Sunday. The crowd lined the road and paved it with their coats. They laid down palm branches and they followed Jesus into the holy city, to the temple. And I want us to think for just a moment, just a moment, what does this look like for us? For he's coming back. Number one, you and I need to be engaged in paving the way. Paving the way. Taking our coats, if you will, and laying them on the road before him. Now, obviously, that's metaphorical. How do we do that? How do we prepare the way? I think of John the Baptist, who prepared the way for the coming of Jesus to do his earthly ministry. He preached about he who was going to come. He pointed people to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He called people to be humbly repentant. He worked hard to turn people's hearts to God. I think that's paving the way. You and I need to be working hard to help people, not just ourselves, but the people who are around us, anybody and everybody who's within our sphere of influence, working so that their hearts are, are being turned like the, like the agricultural soil of spring, breaking up the hard fallow soil so that the 
the seed can be planted and that a harvest can be brought in so that people are ready for when Jesus comes. You know, we really need to be engaged in this redemptive work of the world. Jesus is the Redeemer, but He has invited us, more than invited, He has called and commanded us to be partners with Him in bringing His salvation to this world. We need to pave the way. A second thing I think that comes out of this Palm Sunday picture is that we need to proclaim His coming. We need to proclaim His coming. Does anyone else, and I say else because I do this, Look at bumper stickers and at personalized license plates. Not many of you. Okay. Maybe I'm weird. Don't answer that or comment on that. I know that I am. You know, I drive through 10. I drive down Collins Road. You know, I get stopped at every red light. You know, I, I think they see me coming. I think there's someone who sits at the Department of Transportation says, there's Bill in his truck. Hit the red light. Hit the red light. Huh? They're giving my truck a rest. And I do. I sit there, and I, I, I oh, look, there's bumper stickers. <laughs> what do they say? And used to, I could just sit there. Now I do this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my eye. <laughs> okay, this is what I do nowadays. People proclaim all kinds of stuff on their cars. Have you ever noticed that? There's funny Star Trek stuff. And there's irritating political stuff. And there's my football son can beat up your honor roll's daughter stuff. And there's just stuff. People just plaster it on their cars. And sometimes I laugh. And sometimes I drive by and I look and I say, Can you really be that stupid? I really don't do that. I think it, though. <laughs> Usually when it says Hawkeyes on the back. Personalized license plates. Some of them I sat there and I, I, I have no idea what they, they're saying. You know, I'm, I'm glad you paid extra money to the state for that, but it communicates nothing to no one. But some of them are great. You know, some of them are, are just, you sit there and you can't help but laugh because you know they had a great sense of humor. We proclaim everything. We plaster it on our cars. Are we proclaiming Christ? And I'm not talking about a bumper sticker. I'm not talking about a piece of jewelry. I'm talking about Hosanna to the son of David. I'm talking about blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord with such energy, with such excitement that the detractors of Christ say, shh, stop it. You're unsettling us. You're making us uncomfortable. You're driving us to our safe spaces. Good, you need a safe space. And there's only one that can be found and it is in Jesus Christ. Proclaim his coming until this world knows. Because if he comes today, there's a whole lot. There's a whole lot of people who don't know it and they're not going to be ready. The king is coming. Are you ready for his coming? Are you prepared for him to arrive? The third thing that I would throw out there is simply praise his name forever. Praise his name. What a sweet name is the name of Jesus. Sweetest name I know. An old song proclaimed. There's none like it. For the name of Jesus to ever be upon our lips. For the name of Jesus to fill our thoughts. And guide us through the day. In Eastern Orthodoxy, there is the practice of what they call the Jesus Prayer. I believe that it's taken from Jesus' parable of the Pharisee and of the sinner who went into the temple to pray. And the Pharisee was bold and arrogant, and the sinner said, What? Have mercy on me, a sinner. 
And so in Eastern Orthodoxy, the practice of the, of the Jesus prayer is this, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. And in Eastern Orthodoxy, those who are really committed learn how to phrase that with their breathing. <laughs> Breathe in, Lord Jesus Christ. Breathe out, have mercy. Breathe in on me, a sinner. And they get to the point where it's almost unconscious. They just breathe and pray all day long, even as they're doing everything else. A guy long ago, unnamed, wrote a book called The Way of a Pilgrim. And he wrote it about trying to let the Jesus prayer be his prayer. Now, I'm not suggesting that you do that. What I'm using that as an illustration of is this. In Eastern Orthodoxy, it's all about Jesus. Every breathing moment is about Jesus. And for us, well, I'm afraid that well, Jesus is almost a, an add-on, an extracurricular at times. May he be everything. May we praise his name forever. I, wanna, I want us as a congregation to flock to him, to follow him, to lay everything down before him. I want us to declare his glory and to announce his coming and to refuse to be silenced so that no rock will ever, ever, ever shout for us. Jesus is coming, folks. Are you ready? Jesus is coming. Are you excited? The king is coming. <laughs>